Okay, it is uh, 4.30, so we'll begin the meeting. Will the meeting of the Washington County Fair Board for September 8th please come to order? And uh, present with us, we've got, um, we've got myself, Andy Dyke. Um, Bill Ganger is there, David Noyes, Bob Brawlinger, and Jerry Willey. Uh, absent is Ajoy, um, Ajoy Navin, and uh, Gary Seidel, who, uh, who's not with us today. He's normally the president. So uh, the meeting is called to order and the first order of business is oral communication. This is a period of up to two minutes when any member of the public can address the board. The opportunity is limited to two minutes uh, per individual with the maximum time being 10 minutes for any subject. There is a longer period of 10 minutes at the end of the meeting if anybody else wants to, uh, if anybody wants to uh, discuss something for a little longer. Do I have anybody who wishes to address the board at this time? Uh, Andy, you have Marilyn Lesmeister from um, Oregon State University who has requested to speak. Uh, Marilyn, go ahead. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Marilyn Lesmeister and I am with the Oregon State University Extension Service 4-H program. And my role there is uh, volunteer development and risk management. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to speak with you for a few minutes on behalf um, as you debrief the, the 2021 County Fair. Um, what you're going to hear tonight uh, from a variety of people, from participants and families and volunteers who are, uh, who are your partners in planning and delivering the fair. Um, you're going to hear some concerns about safety and relationships as are also just uh, a summary or um, uh, some examples of the summary uh, that Pat Willis was able to formulate as a result of, of a survey done as well recently. Um, you'll be in the in those con in those conversations. You'll be asked to make. Um, some decisions and take some action this fall to help this great group of 4-H volunteers and 4-H staff make some very important decisions um, as they can as they uh, continue to be your partners in this in this process. And um, I am here to support um, that that partnership with the Washington County Fair and um, the 4-H volunteers and staff there. This is very important. Um, Lee and I got to know each other a bit during uh, the, the, the statewide fair association. And um, this partnership is really important. So I'm here to support all of those efforts. Thanks so much. Well, welcome, Marilyn. And we really appreciate that you're able to take some time out of your day and, and join us today. Thank uh, you. Yeah, help, maybe you can help us through some of these issues. Uh, is there anybody else wishing to uh, to ask any questions, first of all. Uh, we have Jennifer Rischlick. Go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, I was just, uh, does any board member have any questions of, of Marilyn before I move forward? Okay, then we'll go on to Jennifer. Oh, hi. Um, my name is Jennifer Rischlick, and I'm a parent of two kids that show. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Hold on, Jennifer. We're getting, uh, I don't know what happened. Yeah, it, we, lost, we lost your audio there for a second, Jennifer. Okay, sorry, I, I live out in Gales Creek and there was a, there's a fire on Highway 8 and the power's been going on and off out here, so. Um, <laughs> I can hear you. I, can, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Okay, let me start over again. So, my name is Jennifer Richlake and I'm the parent of two kids that show fiber goats, rabbits, KVs, and poultry in both 4-H and FFA. And I'm asking that the fairgrounds provide vet checks and a night watch person for the 2022 county fair, as we didn't have either of these services at the 2021 fair. In years past, the fairgrounds have hired license, a licensed vet, veterinarian to health check all large animals before they come into the fairgrounds to prevent the spread of communicable, communicable diseases between animals or to fair attendees. It's best to have a veterinarian make these decisions as we are not experts on all, the animal, on all animal health at the fair. For the night watch person in past years, the 4-H or FFA community has recommended individuals, typically a 4-H or FFA alum, to be hired by the fairgrounds to keep an eye on the animals. Animals can get out of their pens or get loose from their tieouts. Another duty is to make sure the public is not in our barns. On the first night of the 2021 fair, a few fair attendees 
crawled under the barn doors of the horse barn and went into stalls. Because there was no white watch person on the fairgrounds, the horse advisory hired two college students to spend the remaining two nights in the barn. Again, we need these services to keep the animals safe and secure while at the fairgrounds. The 4-H community is happy to work with the fairgrounds to secure vet checks and a night watch person so exhibitors can safely show animals like we have in so many years past. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Do we have anybody else uh, signed up to speak? I don't have anybody. Oh, hang on. Uh, Melissa Becker. Go ahead, Melissa. Hello, my name is Melissa Becker and I uh, usually have a 4-H dog club. Obviously last year we couldn't do much, um, but I would like to get that going again. But in order to do that, I need somewhere to be able to have my group of kids be able to work with their dogs. And uh, I'm hearing that right now we're not going to really be able to have access to the fairgrounds much during the regular non-fair months. Uh, formally, that's been available on like Wednesday nights, and I would like to see that happen again. It could be on another night, um, but I know that, you know, archery would like to get back in there, uh, some of the rabbit clubs, my dog club, and I'm sure there's a few others. Um, it's really paramount that we get to use those. It's hard for us to find facilities otherwise. And I think that's what kind of the original agreement with the fair many, many moons ago was is that's where we should be able to have our access and that's what it's for. Um, I'd like to see that again. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm, in, I'm playing limbo right now with a dog club. My son, we just have, we have brand new puppies and he wants to start up showing his puppies again and we have nowhere to go. <laughs> so if we get some help out there, that would be fantastic. Um, we really wanna support our own hometown now, I've lived here pretty much my whole life, and I would like to continue doing that. Um, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Is there anything? Um, Andy? Yes. I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead Bill. That is a, a county issue, not a fair board, because she's outside at the four day fair or 10 day fair. So the county has to address that issue. Yeah, that's that's a good point, Bill. And um, uh, just to dispel any uh, any idea that we're batting it back and forth between the fair board and the board of commissioners. For those who are listening, the fair board is in charge of the of the uh, the fair event itself, which is four or ten days, whichever we choose. But um, the county manages the property throughout the year, so that would be something uh, to be done on that side. So thanks for for mentioning that, Bill. Uh, I believe there was a Laura who wished to speak. Um, she asked if she had to sign up in the in the chat there, and the answer is no. You don't have to sign up. If you're on, then we'll we'll um, we'll put you on right now. Yeah, if you raise your hand up, oh, there she is. I see your Laura Marotti. Go ahead, Laura. You are unmuted. Nope, oh, she's still muted. Can you hear me now? Yep. We can now hear I, you. Gotcha. Okay. I am Laura Marotti. I have two girls in 4-H. I'm a club leader, the Club of Clovers. We are a statics club. So we do paintings, drawings, speeches, writing instruments. They have an ensemble. My daughters have been in 4-H for eight years and we've moved from the big exhibit hall to the Clover building. And this year we weren't able to display as a horticulture superintendent, I ran the flower arranging contest and we weren't able to do that either. My daughter is a state ambassador. She just worked six days at State Fair. They are very involved in 4-H. My older daughter just graduated, got so many scholarships. It's been the greatest program for them. But now I'm not sure where you're going to put statics and it worries me. And I thought maybe only because of COVID we weren't allowed to enter things, only five projects. My girls love to enter lots of projects and 4-H is changing. And I'm just, I wanna say it's only because of COVID and that nothing is, else is changing. So please reassure me of that. I have offered my church 
for the awards night because we can't get the Clover building anymore. And we, the learning day, that's been a great thing every year, but we didn't get the Clover building this year. Okay, that's COVID. But, you know, the youth development at the fairgrounds, that's what it's for. And it's been great for my girls. Just please keep it as youth development. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Laura. Questions? Okay, is there any? I just, actually, okay. I just wanna say one thing, Andy, and that was um, that 4-H, 4-H made the decision uh, this year for 2021 due to COVID to not have the static or do the static uh, where they came in just for the day and left. Um, we did offer that they could display at the fair, but because of COVID, that was something 4-H was not comfortable with doing. And in the future, we just assumed that they would be back in the future. So we really hope that they are. We, um, we can either put them in the clover leaf or we had really hoped that they would go in the new exhibit building. But um, I just wanted to just point out that that was, that was certainly offered for this year. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, given that we have a new facility, they may not want to be in the clover leaf. The, the comments that I heard during this last fair about the new facility and how nice it was with the air conditioning and, and sound and the whole works. Yeah, people were loving it there. All right, I've got uh, two more people. Uh, next one is, Aunt, well, have we exceeded the 10 minutes? We probably have. Um, how about, can we do two, the two last two that have their yeah. hands up? Yeah, let's, let's take the last two. Uh, okay. So Annabelle? Annabelle? Go ahead, Annabelle, you're unmuted. Unmute. Okay, yeah, I was uh, thinking I would be at the end, but okay. So first of all, um, I just want to reiterate the mission statement for um, the fair complex. And it says that to preserve the annual county fair and ro rodeo and its heritage. Well, we don't have the rodeo anymore. Promote the world-class agriculture of the county, provide a welcoming environment of all volunteers, commitment to lifelong learning with special emphasis on youth, promote year round facilities for consumer trade shows, public exhibitions and special gatherings, and promote a sense of community among the residents of Washington County. So in order to accomplish this mission, it seems to me that um, we need to, um, you know, support the youth and community programs and that should be paramount now the decisions made. The use of the Cloverleaf building by the staff and volunteers and youth during fair is important. It is closest to all of the um, showing of the, of the um, animals going clear across the fairgrounds to the exhibit hall just doesn't work. Um, it is a place for stocking all of the ribbons and supplies and is a safe place for the youth to come. It is a place where they can go in, they can get showers, they can get their water bottles filled and they have a um, bathroom, which is safe for them, especially those who are staying overnight and having to get ready for showing in the mornings. It is um, not you know, acceptable to me to think about having a rolling station for our staff to go around the fairgrounds or have them have the kids go clear across the fairgrounds to the exhibit hall, um, the new one. And so I think that it should be a place still used for showcasing of their activities and accomplishments, place for them to do presentations, their ed displays, a place for them to meet with the public and discuss 4-H and the opportunities to youth. I think also as a general um, safety place, it is better. And it also, I'm addressing FFA kids as well. In addition, over the years, we have had less and less access, which you said you can't address, but to the Cloverleaf building. But if it's the whole fair complex being um, for the, the county and is owned by the county, then I would think that we need to think about the MOU, which has not been signed this year, which needs to be signed so that we do have access throughout the year for learning events, for um, for the various activities, awards night, evaluation day. We've had to go to um, Clackamas County as a Metro evaluation day for I don't know how many years now because we were unable to get that. We are very willing to work among the um, calendar with the calendar that they have set in place. And, but we cannot be bumped 
whenever we want to have a community service event or a, um, a county learning day inside or outside, which is really important for bringing together the community for the 4-H community and for uh, the community at whole, as a whole. Because we've tried to expand out and say, you know, invite the public so that they can see opportunities for the youth in our community. And we would like to be able to do that. But especially that we do need a central place during fair where it is a safe environment, where the staff is able to meet with the volunteers and the youth and to do the things that need to be done during fair and not expect them to be clear across the fairgrounds. Um, it just doesn't work well. So um, anyway, I would still say that we do need the Cloverleaf building and um, for all events. And if possible, if you could. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to cut you short there, Annabelle. Uh, sure. we're, run, we're running over our two minutes. Uh, yeah. I do want to quickly just just correct one thing, and if I'm wrong, I'm, I apologize. But the MOU between the Fair Board and the Board of Commissioners is not an annual thing. Uh, that that was a one-time signed MOU, and it I, I believe it stays in effect, doesn't it, Leah? Until until both parties say yes, that is that is correct. I think what she's referring to is something that's not Fair Board related, and that is the. Um, agreement between 4-H and the fair complex for youth outside of the fairs, but I assume that she was referring to. Oh, okay, but as far as, yeah, the MOU is the management agreement that uh, essentially uh, the, the fair board, uh, how do I put it, the, the fair board uh, asked the board of commissioners to come in and manage the, the grounds and the facilities because the fair has traditionally not had enough money to do that. And many of the complaints that we're hearing today and in the past stem from lack of facilities. And that's simply because the fair does not generate the kind of money that it takes to put up new facilities. So the Board of Commissioners has, uh, has graciously been doing that throughout the years. Uh, any other comments before I move on? I think um, one other just, person. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. Sorry, I just have one comment um, to make. And then uh, the last person, Angela Sandino, our regional 4-H director could speak. Um, is just that Annabelle was referring to uh, the mission statement, and that is an outdated mission statement that was uh, pre-2010 when the Fair Board managed the facilities year-round, and that um, is not the current Fair Board mission statement. Okay. Uh, who was the last person? Uh, uh, Angela Sandino. And uh, Angela. Go ahead, Angela. Okay, hi, I'll be very brief. Um, thank you for letting me speak. My name's Angela Sandino. I'm the regional director for OSU Extension, and I serve Washington, Clackamas, and Multnomah counties. And so I pretty much oversee um, the administrative re uh, needs and budgets of these three counties. And 4-H um, is one of the programs that we have in our repertoire. We have forestry, we have natural resources, nutrition, and many other things. So 4-H is just one of them. And Marilyn Lesmeister, who spoke briefly, she's the uh, was the former program leader for the entire state for 4-H. But anyway, I just know that this year with the pandemic, it was very difficult and challenging. Um, and frustrating for many, but I do also applaud the Washington County Fair Board and the manager for your hard work to bring the fair forward and especially having a 10 day fair in after a pandemic was a huge thing to pull off and so I, I do appreciate that. Um, also in my role I supervised Pat Willis. Um, and he was many, I, I supervise about 30 people in extension. He was one of them. And he, as you probably know, he retired from OSU extension after about 13 years, um, September 1st, and he is no longer with OSU extension. I did want to let you know, he, we will be filling his position and that position will be serving 4-H in Washington County. We hope to get the position posted and filled by um, at the end of this year and bring somebody new on in January. And so um, that I just want to give you that. And then also I'm here to support all of our stakeholders, our volunteers, our youth, um, and also the county. And so if there's anything I can do to help resolve some of these concerns and issues, you know, we want to bring this forward um, working positively so that FAIR 2022 will be a great success that FAIR and beyond. So thank you very much. Thank you, Angela. Appreciate it. 
Okay, uh, that concludes oral communication for this this portion of the meeting. Let's move on to the reports. And I think the first up is our um, our July 2021 financial report. Or, yes. Oh, the approval, at least the approval of the 2021 financial report. Yes, so you have in front of you the July 2021 uh, financial report, and that is obviously just a very small, you know, the first month of our fiscal year and um, has just a few, um, a few line items of revenue and expenditures for July that uh, relate to the fair. Um, as you all know that most of the revenue gets booked in um, August and most of the expenditures um, are expended in August and September and sometimes in October. So uh, what you have in front of you is just the uh, July only. And as we move forward in a few months, you'll have a more accurate accounting and picture of the entire uh, fair. But this is what we have so far for July. And just to remind you, as I do every year, um, you will, will not see a TLT posted for July. There's never TLT that is posted in July. Uh, the first payment of TLT, transient lodging tax, I'm sorry for those of you that don't know what that is. Um, the first uh, transient lodging tax payment will post for August. Okay. Um, any questions or comments on the financials? Uh, yes, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Willie. Hi, Leon. Was there? Um, I realize that was a great recap because we don't need to focus on just July because there's a lot of stuff that uh, isn't posted in there. Um, <clears throat> just looking back on the on the fair. Was there was there any surprise expenses? Um, were you um, pleased with the revenue side of things generally? You're probably going to give a report here pretty soon, but let's stay with the financial side of it. Just was there any surprises in there? Um, I don't know that there were necessarily surprises. I think that, and, and you're right, I am going to talk about it a little bit more later, but I think there's two things that stand out and that one of them, and I'm sure everybody's hearing about this uh, throughout, I mean, we listened to this about at our department director's meeting today, and that is just the cost of goods and services are really expensive right now. And supply chain issues are causing things um, to be expensive, such as staffing. Um, staffing is, you know, it's hard to get staff and um, uh, getting staff, uh, temporary staffing in was very expensive this year. Um, just getting equipment, everything cost more. Um, renting light towers and generators and uh, water trailers, just, um, and then we couldn't even get water trailers uh, for the arena because of supply chain issues, but porta potties were more expensive and just everything cost more. And, you know, we hear that from everywhere. Our food vendors, um, their costs were higher because food cost more and uh, their truck drivers cost more and everything was just more. And then, um, so that was, I guess it wasn't necessarily a surprise, but um, it was certainly a little bit uh, difficult to deal with just the high costs of absolutely everything. And then um, the one thing that I think, it's not necessarily a surprise, it was something that I forgot about. And that was back in 2018, no, 2019, I apologize. Uh, you'll probably all remember that the Sheriff's Department told us in 2019, after the 2019 fair, that they were gonna start charging us for their services in 2020. Well, in 2020, we didn't have a fair. And then when they came forward in 2021 to start talking about you know, the service that they would provide for the fair, they reminded me that they uh, would, were going to start charging. And um, so that was a, an unexpected, kind of unexpected cost. It was just um, kind of something that we forgot about because in 2020, we didn't do it. And then in 2021, we did have that expenditure. Um, and you will see that um, in, I, in the finances, it's you know fifty three thousand dollars that we didn't um, budget for in the overall um, revised budget that I presented to you a few months before we actually had the fair. Uh, but I do want to point out um, in that um, surprise um, cost is that the Oregon State Fair. I sit on the board of the Oregon State Fair, uh, and they're an eleven day fair, not a ten day fair. But um, the Oregon State Police provides them their services. Uh, for security, much like the Washington County Sheriff's Department provides us our services. And the Oregon State Police charged the Oregon State Fair almost $200,000 for an 11-day event. So it really put the $53,000 from our wonderful 
Washington County Sheriff's Department in perspective and reminded me of what a great partner and value that they are for us and um, the, what we get um, from services from them um, for a very reasonable price. Okay, uh, uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, then I will entertain a motion to accept the finances. I move that we accept the finances. A second. There is a motion and a second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, it passes. You wanna move on to the educational fund then? Yes, uh, this is Bob Rollinger. Uh, we did have a great meeting last month. Uh, we, we dusted off our casino night uh, plans that we had that got canceled by COVID. Uh, and we pretty much uh, have a um, everything in place um, uh, to start out if we're if we're able to have it again. Um, for I'm I'm really glad to hear that these people that are uh, here with supporters from 4-H. I'd like you to hear this message. I tried for years to get Pat Willis to help me get involved with the 4-H meetings to help this education fund, um, one of your, one of your um, points that you bring up is needing more money. This was, this was started pretty much by Leah and put together with the board to, to raise money for those shortfall funds that would happen during the fair. And I'm gonna tell you that he would never let me get to a meeting. He'd never get me to a list to call people. And I was brand new. Uh, and I, I would like to see that bridge made so that we can come up with uh, the amount of money that these kids need for hand washing stations and so on and so forth. Um, and so if you're all listening, everybody knows how to get a hold of me. Uh, let's get that done. Um, I've been, as I said, I've tried for years and been snowballed, uh, stonewalled by Pat. Um, uh, even at the fair, I've asked them many times, hey, walk me through the barns. Let's go talk to people uh, to try to promote this deal. Uh, and he'd say, well, all I do is walk around. Let's go have an ice cream. So I'm giving you a report on, on his performance with me. Uh, so uh, I'd like everyone to take that into consideration. With uh, The other thing I'd add uh, is through no help from him, we were able to... Um, get money together really quick for your virtual auction for forage for all the, the cattle. Uh, and that was led by that was led by the fair board, Leah and the rest of the board here through Rotary. So that's what I have to say about our update. And I look forward to a lot of help for our next uh, casino night. Bob, could, could you uh, could you tell everyone when that will be if you if, if you're able to have it? Um, we're going to have to come out with that. It's going to a lot of it's going to depend on our on, on our vendors, but we're looking at sometime in April. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I know it's a lot of fun. The last time you had it, uh, it was it was just a blast. But the shame of it is, and you, you you touched on it, it's really hard to get the beneficiaries of these dollars to come out and support this fundraising effort. But I think all of us are committed to raising the funds and, and supporting youth, irregardless of whatever the demands are that are put on us and whatever accusations there are. We've got to raise money first in order to provide some of the things that have been asked for both in letters and today in oral testimony. And they, they go hand in hand. So we, we are committed to try to make that happen. Any other comments? Okay, then we will move on to the FAC update. Who's who's doing that one? Uh, that would normally be Gary Seidel. And since he's not with us today, I just, I'll report for him, which was that we have no report. Uh, the FAC has not met uh, since the last fair board meeting and there's not currently um, a meeting scheduled, but I believe that one is going to be scheduled here by the end of the year. Okay. Okay, how about 4-H uh, update? Is that Marilyn or Angela? Who's, who's doing that one? I'm not sure um, if Angelo or Marilyn, if somebody or Darcy, if you're giving a report, will you raise your hand so I can enable you to speak? Now, Pat is completely gone, right? He's no longer, I mean, he's completely retired. As far as I know, yes. 
Uh, well, I don't see. Ah, that's a shame. Hang on, just let me look one more time. All right, um, so no 4-H report. Is that correct? No hands up? Oh. Well, let's talk oh, about I, it. I got a hand up, hold on. Oh, right. I got to figure out who it is. Uh, oh, it's Marilyn, hold on. Go ahead, Marilyn. Thank you so much. Uh, the joys of, of technology. Um, yes, Pat Willis um, is fully retired as of the end of, of August. And, um, and so I really, I appreciate the conversation that is being held and thank you, um, Angela Sandino for, for the report as to the timeline and how we're moving forward to support the 4-H program in Washington County and, and hiring. Um, I, I, um, I want to uh, support and encourage the, the opportunity to, to uh, share potential solutions for things that this open conversation is providing an opportunity uh, today. And, um, and I think we're hearing some solutions from, uh, from some of the speakers, uh, some potential solutions. And, and some need for clarification about those MOUs and, and what roles there are. I certainly agree that there are some, um, there's always a need to clearly understand roles. So I think we're, we're, we're definitely in this together and this opportunity to speak openly is a great opportunity. So um, that's, I will just add that to the conversation and we look forward to uh, getting the Washington County 4-H staff uh, uh, fully, fully uh, filled, I should say, having that, that having that staff filled, and um, and continuing to work closely as a partner with uh, with the fair. Marilyn, I, I do have a question. Sure. The, the process of filling um, Pat's role, who who is involved in that? Is that is that uh, uh, OHSU and and um, the, the board of commissioners or is it the fair board involved or I, I guess I'm trying to understand it completely how that's how that process works. Good. Thanks for call. Thanks for asking the question. Well, I'm starting that answer. Leah, would you also open up uh, Angela Sandino's mic if she'd like to join in, please? Um, to begin that answer is that there's always a search committee that is that has representation from from yes staff, not only in Washington County, but but surrounding areas, as well as the community. So it is not necessarily always the a fair board representative, it could be, but um, it is not necessarily always a fair board representative, it is uh, representation from across that community. Um, and representing the diversity of Washington County in this case as well. So it can easily be um, the school representation because of the education. The 4-H mission is 100% is educational. And our, our involvement at your fair, as in all fairs, is the opportunity to inform and educate the public about and gives young people a chance to um, present themselves, public speaking, and all of those kinds of things that are truly life skills. So we're about education. And, um, and so that mission is perpetuated as well as being available to all people across the county uh, where that staff is hired. So diversity is really important as well. Um, Angela, are you, pre are you there? Yes, I am. And I can just add a little bit to that just because this is an extremely important position for us in Washington County, as you might imagine, this will be pretty much the face of 4-H for us um, serving our community. Um, we have right now, we're um, hoping that by mid-September, we will have our committee finalized. We're going to have a somewhat small committee. The new 4-H program leader wants about five people to serve on that committee, the hiring committee. We're hoping to get the position posted for 30 days, and that would be the week of September 27th. Then um, the position would close if that position makes it by September 27th, the week of October 25th. And we would hope to have um, review applications in early November and then mid-November start interviews, early December final, and then offer somebody that position in mid-December. Um, we also, like Marilyn said, it's really important for us to reflect the diversity of our county. And so we have somebody who serves on the committee, making sure that we're looking at applications from a wide variety of um, 
you know, candidates and, and not ruling people out just because maybe they don't have the educational background or the experience, but, but do they bring to the position what we're looking for, a true collaborative person willing to really um, be innovative and work with the community to solve issues and make the fair and 4-H really successful in Washington County. I would also add if there is, um, if that small committee is doesn't um, currently include a fair board member, there's other ways to be involved. Um, upon the finalists, I'm going to say three or five, three, four or five finalists that might be interviewed, um, that the community in general, 4-H volunteers across the county and, um, and the fair board could be uh, could in fact view those interviews via Zoom. And, um, and those who also view those interviews and also have the opportunity to provide written input. And that is considered by that search committee as well. So okay. that is another way to be involved. Yes. That, that sounds good. Uh, any other questions on that? Oh yeah, uh, Bill. Uh, while you're doing the selection, you have a gap and 4-H year starts October 1st. Is there somebody somewhat in charge until the new person gets on board? Great question, I'll take that. Um, we are lucky to have a 0.5 um, 4-H faculty member in Washington County. She was at the fair this summer, her name is Alice Phillips. And we have assigned uh, some of the very most crucial of job responsibilities to her in the meantime. Right. And I see a question, maybe does somebody else have a question for us? Not seeing any. Oh, oh there was a hand up and I, I guess it's gone. Yeah, uh, David Noyce, uh, Washington County Fair Board member. Uh, I appreciate your input and your comments. And I think it would be a good idea for this fair board to be uh, involved at some level or provide input with the selection process. Awesome. We will let you know when we have opportunities. And like Marilyn said, it could be um, looking at the finalists and giving us your feedback and meeting them and seeing if they might be a good fit. So we'll, we will definitely contact you when we're at that stage, but that would be great. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marilyn and Angela. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and I and I apologize. I don't know if I said OSU or or OHSU, but <laughs> happens all the time. Yes, no problem. Sometimes you. my uh, mouth goes faster than my brain. Definitely. <laughs> okay, move, moving on. Um, I should have mentioned Ajoy has joined us, and thanks, thanks Ajoy. <laughs> I, I meant to uh, mention it as soon as you came on, just so it's in the meeting minutes. Okay, uh, I guess we go into old business. So we get a county fair update. Yes, so thank you. And uh, yeah, don't worry. Uh, I noticed when Ajoy got on and uh, was able to promote him in. So, and obviously, this um, meeting is being recorded. So, it's reflected in our online meeting minutes that we post for website. Um, so, I just want to talk about um, I've got three slides about the county fair, and then the fair board can certainly discuss or ask questions. But um, so I've got a slide about the successes. I'm going to give you a slide about the challenges, and I'm going to give you some facts about the fair. Um, and then I'm certainly open for uh, questions. Um, but I think the top of my success list is the fact that we even had a fair. Um, you know, in April we talked about you know we wanted to have a, some sort of fair for the community. We didn't know what that was going to look like. We talked about having a parking lot fair with drive-through. Um, food and, you know, just, you know, any type of fair event. And, and from there, it just evolved. It seemed like there was days where it evolved every hour. And as things with COVID changed and the pandemic changed, um, we got new guidelines from the state. Uh, things were relaxing from requirements. We were able to, to keep evolving what that fair was going to look like. So it went from in April to a drive through parking lot event to a full-blown, uh, you know, event with, you know, with, with as much things as we could possibly offer um, in, you know, two and a half months uh, with really um, in April, we had three employees. And um, by the time we got to July, we had a few more, but it wasn't too many more. But so the fact that we even had a fair at all is amazing. And, you know, I, I do want to thank 
you all. Um, it was your insistence in April that we really wanted to do something for the community. They deserved, uh, deserved to have some sort of fair event. I do recall Jerry specifically saying, you know, we need to offer something to the community no matter what it is. And so I really appreciate your, um, your leadership and your support in that. Um, we put so much into the fair with such short notice um, and the staff supported all the partners from volunteers to contractors the very best that we could during a pandemic with a severe staff shortage. And while we know that this year was very frustrating to many people, um, we do appreciate and value, you know, everybody who did come out and, and the people who provided feedback, even some of it was negative. We do um, really appreciate and value everything that everybody put into the fair, so thank you. Uh, so back to successes, um, we had animals on site and they were well visited and very much enjoyed by the, by the public. Um, again, back in April, when we were first talking about what we could do, 4-H wasn't even allowed to get together. And obviously over time, they got to be able to um, do some things in person and were able to have some animals at the fair. And we know that 4-H's numbers were severely diminished. Um, I believe that Pat Willis at one point told us under normal years, non-pandemic years, we had 1,400 kids in 4-H. And I think he told us at one point that there was less than 250 and half of those were livestock. So um, we really are appreciative. That was a big success that we had any animals at the fair. So we really thank those who were able to, to be there. Um, the wingspan was a big success. Um, we always knew that it was going to be, but man, um, that building got used and it got used well. Um, I think you have some facilities people down at the county who would like the fair to not use the wingspan in the future. The wingspan took a bit of a beating. Um, it, again, we told you this in 2020 that we thought having um, the fair be the first event to really kind of kick the tires on the wingspan building. Um, and while we had a couple of small events prior to the fair, the fair really put the wingspan through its paces. We learned the things that it can't do. We learned the things that didn't hold up. We learned that roll-up doors, you know, got broken and things didn't, you know, do so well with a really hard event. And the good news is, is the building's under warranty and we were able to get the contractors right away out there to fix broken doors and um, bathroom faucets that, um, and I want to thank uh, Bob Rollinger for letting me know that the bathroom faucets were having problems with scalding water. And what we figured out is that the adjustment for the hot water is, is open. Uh, anybody can get in there. And so kids were going under the sink and turning the water up to scalding. So now county facilities knows that in a public facility, that's probably not a great thing. So they're working on making sure that that is no longer accessible to the public. It was a constant problem throughout the entire fair. We ended up having to keep a staff person in there all the time to ensure that those little rascals were not messing with the hot water. Um, the other great success was our volunteer groups. We had some amazing volunteer groups. We had uh, the volunteer groups that worked in the parking lots and that sold ice and our 4-H volunteers and all we just had some great volunteers uh, groups that did some amazing things for us and we we're appreciative that they were here and got to raise funds during the fair such as the baseball team the football team and and we were really ha happy that they were able to pull together at the last minute and get their people together to provide services for the fair for the garbage and other things um, which takes me on to the contractors vendors and entertainers um with two months notice getting contractors vendors and entertainers in here to provide the fair that we had um, was hard and um, they all rallied and worked really hard and we got vendors in here and contractors to help us hire the vendors with only three, three staff people. Um, we didn't even have people to do that. So again, that was a great success. And then I think our public safety was a huge success. We had our sanitation team, boy, did they have their work cut out for them with 180,000 people. Uh, keeping the buildings and the grounds clean was a constant effort, um, not just from regular, you know, trash pickup and cleanup and spills and things, but also just thinking about COVID and constantly sanitizing tables and sanitizing bathrooms and having the sheriff's department um, in the grounds and having Hillsborough Police Department outside the grounds, uh, managing our roads surrounding it and Metro West, who I don't know how many people they had to haul out for heat stroke, but it was a lot. 
So uh, really just, you know, lots of success with our public safety. So that's uh, my list of successes. Um, I'm gonna go right into my challenges slide. And that is obviously we were pandemic affected. We're still pandemic affected. Um, there was also a major public perception issue about 4-H and FFA being excluded this year. There were people, and there are actually 4-H people who believe that the reason there weren't animals in the barns this year was because the, the fair board kicked them out and didn't allow them to participate. And you know we know that's not true. And, and Pat Willis knows that's not true, but Pat's not here anymore. But um, you know there was just a lot less people and, and justifiably so, there were a lot of people who weren't able to take the time off from work with last minute notice. They were concerned about their kids being exposed to COVID and there was just less kids. So we are, uh, well, we're very grateful that they were here. It was, it was definitely a big challenge. Yeah, if I yeah. could interrupt there, um, part, part of it I think is just the fact that because we didn't know we were gonna have a fair until, until late in the year, kids weren't able to get their animals. They didn't make that investment because they weren't certain they'd be able to show. And that's not our fault. It's just a, a reality of the year. Yeah, there, I think there was just so many different factors and it was it was unfortunate. I think that the good news is, is the public was ready for the fair and they showed up and thought that everything would be normal. Um, and and just reminding people that we were still affected by the pandemic was, was, um, was hard. Um, I alluded to this earlier, but staffing was a major challenge. Staffing was a challenge for us, um, from our own staff. We were down a lot of staff. Uh, getting temporary staff in was virtually impossible, and we just did, plain didn't have enough help. But staffing from um, even our vendors and our food vendors and our carnival, boy, they had a heck of a time. Um, our vendors just did not have enough staff to staff their booths. Um, and, the, and we had some vendors that weren't able to buy a booth and attend the uh, the fair this year, people who'd had booths at the fair for years because they simply didn't have staff to man the booth and food vendors that couldn't find staff um, and, you know, had to not bring as many uh, food stands as they normally would. Just staffing was a major challenge this year. Um, and, and it's still a major challenge out there in the world. I mean, we hear about it daily. Uh, equipment was a major challenge. Getting equipment was really hard. Um, for a variety of reasons. One of the big reasons we couldn't get a lot of the equipment that we ordered was a lot of rental equipment got put out, uh, was, was being used by uh, wildland fires, uh, light towers, water, water trucks, um, hand washing stations. Uh, the things that we use for the fair are things that are used for wildland fire support as well. And obviously uh, wildland fire support is, is, is very important. And so that's where the equipment that we had previously reserved went so we weren't able to get all of our equipment which was hard and then there was a, equipment that we ordered that we couldn't get here because of uh, truck driver shortages so uh, just a lot of challenges when it comes to that and then there was just some of the complaints such as complaints about cost we had a lot of people complaining about the cost of food and I will agree that they were very expensive um, I'm sure I don't remember if I told you in July or not that Cisco Foods shut down their um, their food service for uh, mobile units um, and only was providing service to, to brick and mortar restaurants. So our food vendors were having to not, not get their contracted food through Cisco, which is at a, a very discounted rate. So they're having to buy retail food at Costco and Albertsons and Safeway. And so it caused costs to go up, which is also affected by staffing. So staffing is more expensive, food costs were more expensive, which is passed along to the consumer. So. Uh, but I agree, it, the things were expensive. We also had a lot of complaints about no concerts and uh, that was, um, I really got hammered a lot for no concerts and, you know, just, you know, telling people, well, we couldn't really book concerts last minute. Um, there were some fairs that never canceled their contracts and they were keeping their fingers crossed that they were able to move forward. And they were very lucky that they could, such as the Oregon State Fair. Um, but we canceled our contracts with concerts early, early on. So getting them back two months out was obviously not, not something we could do. And even then, when we did make the decision to move forward, we were still under highly restricted attendance requirements and things. So trying to explain that to people was very difficult. Um, and, and some people did understand, but some people just, they, were, they want their concerts. And so that's something we're going to have to talk about. Um, We've all had that hard conversation about concerts. Concerts are very expensive and challenging to put on. 
I can't imagine what they would have been um, like to try to put on with all these supply chain issues and high costs this year. And then uh, complaints about the new new 4-H horse arena. We you know know that 4-H horse people are very unhappy with the arena. And um, we did bring in um, a couple people about, um, we brought some 4-H horse people in. Actually, 4-H horse people came in and looked at the arena and found that it was unacceptable. We brought in, and I know I forwarded some emails to you, uh, in early July, we brought in some um, independent arena evaluation people that um, have their own professional arenas and they uh, compete professionally that came in and looked at the arena and they had their opinions about it and the sheriff's posse have their opinion about it. So uh, we need to get, um, now that fall is here and I always feel like, you know, once we get past uh, Labor Day weekend, we it's kind of like going back to school. We're back working on the fair and events and we can start putting together a group to figure out what we're going to do with that horse arena to make sure it's usable for the future. But um, so we had lots of successes, lots of challenges, but um, all in all, we put on a good fair for, for the, the public and um, I'm very proud of what we did um, with, with the short notice. So thank you for the support. Uh, any questions before I move on to some facts? Looks right. like not. Nope. Okay. Good. So uh, attendance overall for 10 days, we were open for 82 hours. And in that 82 hours, we brought in 180,212 people through the turnstiles at our two and three gates. Um, 2019, we did 89,276 over four days. Total operating hours were 56. I, I was finding it hard to compare four days to 10 days. So I started comparing operating hours. Um, but 180,000 people um, over those 10 days, I think, was um, was really great. I think that that was more than we expected. So um, kudos to the, the people who came out and were committed to coming to the fair. Uh, carnival revenue, um, a little over 500,000, 521,853 dollars in 2019. Um, just a little over 260,000. The carnival, as you know, and, and you've heard it in emails and things, and we've heard it from our 4-H partners, um, that the carnival is so important to the fair board. The carnival is so important to the fair board because our community shows us with their pocketbook how important the carnival is to them. And I know not a lot of, not, not everybody goes to the carnival, not everybody likes the carnival, but we have a large percentage of our community that is very interested in the carnival. Um, and that our revenue reflects that. And the lines in the carnival reflect that. I don't know if any of you went to the carnival. Um, I walked through the carnival you know, a couple times every day and the lines are crazy. And uh, they brought in more carnival rides this year and spaced things out to help with lines, but uh, it remains a very, very popular thing for people to do at the fair. Uh, commercial vendor revenue, um, we, we didn't have too many commercial booths outside because we really chose to focus on inside in our brand new Wingspan Event Conference Center. And uh, we sold $172,000 in vendor booths. And um, while we didn't sell out the, the Wingspan, uh, it did very well. We sold about, um, the Wingspan can hold a 204 10 by 10 vendor spaces and our contracted vendor salesperson sold just about 160 booths in the wingspan and then um, a few booths outside. So we did very well on commercial uh, vendors as well. And we have a lot more capacity to grow for the future. Concession revenue, uh, which includes alcohol, also did well um, up over 2019, 211,000 in 2019 and two, uh, 315,500 for, um, for this year over 10 days. Uh, parking revenue, um, this one again into hours, we, we operated parking for 62 hours, we sold parking for 62 hours as opposed to 56 hours, so not a lot of difference between the, the six days that we sold parking as opposed to the four days in the past, and we went from just a little under 140,000 to just a little over 192,000, so that just shows you how many people were really, really coming um, and parking and coming in to enjoy the fair. And then livestock numbers. Um, I put at the very bottom the 2019 um, between 4-H and FFA, we had 358 youth in 2019 that exhibited 645 animals. And that includes 4-H horse fair. And even though they were off site in 2019, Pat Willis did provide those numbers uh, to me because they did have their fair. So that was numbers that 4-H reported. 
Um, and obviously, we didn't have that uh, 358 kids here and there's 645 animals this year, but we did have some animals and we had uh, 27 horses from 4-H on the first weekend. We had a couple of longhorns in the barn and I really wanna thank Bill Ganger for having the cows in the barn, his uh, six calves. They were very popular. We got a lot of feedback about um, those calves at the information booth and the naming contest was very popular. And Bill, I got the names that you guys picked and we are going to do a Facebook post on that. Um, but I do need you to have someone send me some photos. I took some photos, um, but they didn't turn out very well. So we wanna post photos with the names on Facebook. So if you can, if anybody took any photos of the, of the white calves, please send those to me. But um, Bill, I really do want to thank you for being there. That was, I, we did get a lot of comments about uh, those cute fluffy white cal calves in the barn and people loved them. Um, and the, their bawling for the first few days of the fair was uh, quite funny. So thank you again for bringing them out. Uh, the public loved it. Um, and then the posse was um, there the first weekend, uh, actually both weekends as well. And um, when we put them in their own barn and they asked if they could have a setup, um, we told them yes, since we had barn capacity. And I don't know if all of you walked through uh, the barn and saw the posse set up, but it was very popular. And again, um, while our, the public really did comment at the information booth, how much they loved having horses in general, they were thrilled to see horses at the fair. Uh, the posse was was very popular, so um, we're grateful that they were there. And then, um, and on that first weekend, we had uh, 12 livestock campground sites used um, out there in the livestock campground that we provided. And then on the second weekend, we had 37 swine, uh, 48 goats, and I didn't get a count on the the 4-H um, small animal. So hopefully, someone can get us some numbers on that. Um, but on that second weekend, and I don't have. Um, all the exact numbers of how many youth participated on that second weekend from 4-H yet. Um, but I do know that we had 13 FFA youth with 19 animals partic uh, participate. Um, FFA got me that information. And they used 14 livestock campground sites out there during that second week. And that is it for my um, quick fair facts. And I'm happy to answer any questions or if you guys wanna discuss something, um, feel free, now's the time. I'd like um, to hear how the auction did. I have not gotten a report from the auction. Okay, I had a question about the uh, the growth potential you were talking about in the Wingspan Center. When I was there, the the main hall looked like it was full. Are are you anticipating that you would spill over into some of the conference rooms, or where's that growth potential at? So actually, they all the spaces weren't sold. So we've we've uh, we sold just a little over 170 of the 204 booths that are available in there. So we'll sell some more booths in there. We spread things out. You know, we wanted to make sure that there was lots of uh, breathing room and, and walkway room. Um, just with the pandemic, we wanted to try to keep things out a little bit. So we have the capacity to build there as well. And we also have the capacity to put um, exhibitions out in the in the lobby and in the, um, in the, um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank, on the, in the conference center as well, if, if we need to. So there, um, in the future, if 4-H wants to continue to stay in the Cloverleaf, which it sounds like um, that may be the case, that's certainly something we'll talk to uh, the 4-H staff about which way they want to go if they want to be able to expand and move into the um, into the uh, conference center, or if they'd like to stay in the Cloverleaf, that's certainly up to them. Um, we've already talked to some FFA members. It sounds like we um, when they do their their displays, we can put them in the ex, uh, in the conference center. So if we've got some capacity, that would be where we could grow. But we certainly have the ability to sell more space um, in the in the wingspan, and then we have the capacity to put more booths outside as well. Okay. Oh, the other, the only other uh, thing I wanted to say, it's a, more of a comment, and that's about the carnival. You know, the mantra has, for the last several years has been that we're turning into one big carnival, and. The reality is we've always had a carnival. Now this year it was bigger because they, they brought in more rides so that they could uh, socially distance. But at the same time, uh, I guess the, the challenge that I would have is that uh, if the carnival were detracting from other, other things, I would buy into the idea that we were becoming one big carnival. But I don't see any indication that anything is, is um, not being taken care of because we have a carnival. Does that make any sense? Yeah. It's just, it's not an either or. And, and I think uh, people are using, using that as a rallying cry 
to decry the whole fair event when it has nothing to do with whether or not we support youth. So, anyway, but you're absolutely right. Clearly, the public wants to come partially because of the carnival. And if it were not for the carnival, there would be less people visiting the animals. Well, you guys have heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again. I think I say this several times a year to you all is that um, the fair, every fair is different. So there's 36 county fairs and, a, and you know, and then a state fair in Oregon. And, and I think there's over 60 county fairs in Washington and every fair is different and every fair is a reflection of their community. And um, it's not up to us to say what everyone's fair experience is. And for some people, it's coming out and going on the rides. For some people, it's only walking through the barns. And for some people, it's coming out and getting a corn dog and listening to music. And I'm just happy that that we are able to provide something for everybody and that um, every fair is different and every fair gets to reflect their community. Any other comments before moving? Uh, yeah, Bob. Yeah, um, I, I spent a lot of time at the fair this year and a lot of it down with Bill and the animals. Um, and I, I personally talked to, uh, first of all, a lot of the vendors and every single one of them said, thank you for giving us a job because they had been out of work for a long time. Uh, the same thing for the, the carnival. Uh, I talked to our sponsors. Um, I just wanna go on record too, is I spent some time over with Metro West uh, as a fair board member I heard no complaints whatsoever. Uh, and I was there on a fact finding mission myself. So I just want to throw that in there also. Okay. And uh, yeah, hey, Joy. Hey, Joy. Um, just want to go on like what Bob said. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank like Leah and the whole county staff for putting together such a wonderful show. This is my first year experience on the board. Uh, it's been spectacular. I've looked at like all the, the logistics that goes behind the scenes. I've been a fair goer for a long time, but like looking at the logistics, pulling it together in like two months time, phenomenal work. So kudos to Leah and her team and the entire county staff, right? And of course they're like, you know, like we heard from other people say, like people had bittersweet experience, but like I really wanted to thank them for all the valuable feedback, which is what makes us like even stronger and come out like better next year. So thanks all of you who had shared the feedback, right? Uh, one thing, Leah, like I just wanted to point out uh, also kind of like share is like, um, like, you know, like Bob said, I was also at the uh, fair, like talking with the vendors, like you know, talking with few customers. Uh, one thing that came up repeatedly was like the cost, cost of concession and also the lack of water fountains or uh, um, like, you know, like the water stands, like people were forced to buy these water bottles. I'm sure we have a plan going in next year, but I would just like to hear like, you know, in terms of, uh, are there going to be any uh, evaluations that we are going to do or like get feedback from the community in terms of like, you know, what could be done, like, you know, given the whole pandemic situation, like you know, we were restricted on certain things, but are there going to be implements going forward into the next year in terms of price and then also the essential needs for people, right? What, so just a joy, what was the, the price comment? I'm sorry, I missed that. So um, uh, so the pricing on the concession food for the food concession. Oh, yeah. 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 So we don't, we don't set the prices for the concessions. Um, each individual stand sets their own prices. And again, like I said earlier, you know, with the high cost of staffing and the, um, the supply chain issues with food, the prices were in, I agree that they were, they were high and, um, but we don't, we, you know, we don't set their prices for them. And um, we can certainly look at um, some ways to try to assist with that. We would probably need to reduce, um, reduce the percentage that they give us in order to probably entice them to lower their prices. But those are certainly things we can look at. And then on the water, I, I just, you know, really quick, the city of Hillsborough Water Department normally does an amazing display um, of a big booth and they give away, they have water refilling stations and they've been doing it for years and they, they did not uh, participate this year because of COVID. They did not feel comfortable exposing their staff um, during COVID. Um, and that booth was sorely, sorely missed. And um, we're really hoping that they're gonna be back this year because that was where Everybody went to refill their water bottles, and um, boy, that was it was 
it was rough to not have them there. And we're really grateful for the service that they normally provide the community. Thank you. Okay. If there's nothing else, we'll move on to other old business. Is there any other old business? How about new business? Oh, go ahead. I do. Nope. Sorry. I don't have any uh, other old business unless somebody else does. Nope. Go ahead, Leah. And I also don't have any new business. So um, he has got some business. Uh, oh, go ahead, Bill. Back to the the arena. You said we're going to look at it. Are we going to try to get some certification on this arena saying it's safe or whatever? Is certify it so the liability is not on the fair board. It's somewhere. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, and I I don't know. It, I, I'm not aware of any arena certification program. I can certainly check there might be. I, I'm just not aware of it, but I can certainly check around to see if that exists. That's not a bad idea. Um, but really, I think I'm more interested in getting a small group of, um, you know, a couple of 4-H horse people and, you know, the posse because they're heavy users of our arena and, um some other people who use the arena and have expressed an interest in assisting us with this pro you know, process, kind of um, independent um, opinions. Um, last year during the wildfires, we had a lot of horse people that had their horses on the grounds and um, they have stayed in touch and, and have um, asked to be involved. And they, I've had several of them come out and look at the arena and they have their opinions and 4-H has their opinions and the posse has their opinions. And I think, we just kind of need to get everybody together and uh, get a consensus consensus on what is um, best for everyone and figure out what can what can be done if anything. I think this this uh, debate's going to go forever if we don't get some you know certification of saying that Dean is safe. Yeah, I, I know a 4-H judge and some 4-H um, horse. Um, parents and volunteers um, said it wasn't safe. And then we had the posse and um, a pro uh, another professional uh, horse trainer tell us it was safe. So I, I think it's probably subjective depending on who's doing the writing. So, um, but it's a good idea, Bill. I'll see what I can find. It. Okay. What was the uh, situation with the vet? Do we normally hire a vet to be there? Or? We don't normally hire a vet. We normally have volunteer vets and uh, the vets that have volunteered in the past, um, we were not um, able to get their service this year. And then I did try to hire a couple of vets who just did not have the capacity or the time. So um, I did talk to the state veterinarian and um, let him know that we were struggling to find a vet to help us with vet checks. And uh, as we got closer and closer to fair, um, you know, Ryan just said, if we couldn't find somebody, then you know we couldn't find somebody. We just had to do the best that we could, which is you know really what we had to do. And um, in reference to night watch, um, normally 4-H picks their night watch people um, because it's, we want them to be comfortable with the people that are watching their animals at night. And um, I did ask 4-H to um, if they found somebody to send them over, we would um, put them on payroll, but. Um, that didn't happen. So it sounds like they found their own and um, hired them instead of running them through us. But 4-H uh, did send us an invoice, which we will be paying. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things on the vet check, uh, OSU has a vet school and I'm sure they have students that are just about ready to graduate a card out to be vets. Uh, maybe we can contact them and have them come out and provide a service. It'd be a good hands-on deal for them. Yeah, I, I tried working with Pat Willis on that over the years. And um, sometimes they would have some vet students that would come out and volunteer with the, the volunteer vets that we had. And some years they were not able to get um, people, but um, looking forward to working with um, OSU staff on seeing what we can figure out for next year. Okay. Well, I don't always like to bring it up, but Gary Seidel and I both have experience with handling animals. Uh, Absolutely. I, I don't think I don't think they want you to be their vet, though, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody okay. asked me when I was with Bill and all the people down there, and I got to learn a lot and answer some questions. And someone said, "Are these your are these your cows?" I said, "No, I'm I'm partners with Bill." 
He, he breeds them, feeds them, raises them, and I pet them. <laughs> you did, did a really good job with that. Yeah. Well, um, since we haven't beat this horse to death yet, um, the sand, the, uh, I'm sorry, bad pun. Um, that was a bad pun. The, the, um, the footing, the sand. It would seem to me that this doesn't, this isn't necessarily subjective. It could be objective. It's either granular sand or it's not. And of course, you'd have to look at it with a magnifying glass to find out. But it seems to me it would be pretty simple to, to find out for certain. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know of an expert who can give a definitive answer. And that's the real problem, I think, because it's, it becomes a he said, she said other thing otherwise. But I was tempted to go out there myself, grab a handful and, and check it just to see what people are talking about. I've got a bag in my office. Stop by anytime. Okay. I might do it. <laughs> But uh, I'm just I'm just getting tired of the controversy. It starts with one person saying it, and it just takes on a life of its own, just like so many of these other things that we've heard. Yeah, That's what I'm saying we need to get it in the bud. Yep. Yeah. No, I I agree absolutely. Okay. Any other uh, matters of concern? Not yeah. for me. Okay, then I guess that takes us back. I to have a, oh. I have a couple matters of concern. Uh, go ahead. And uh, I, I would, I'd, I'd like an opportunity for this fair board uh, since, since this letter came out, I'd like to sit down with Chair Harrington and the rest of the, the uh, uh, county supervisors because a lot of this stuff is just made up. I know it personally to be made up. And uh, I don't think uh, from our, from, uh, my standpoint is a responsible person that I can allow that to stand without saying anything. So I'd, I'd welcome the opportunity. I'd welcome the opportunity to Pat Willis to just sit there. Um, I'm not afraid to confront this face to face and head to head and have this conversation. Um, I think I have the wheelhouse and the skill set to do that. That's why the fair board hired me. And I have, you have experience running a company and being a manager and so do I. And I think we need to, uh, since all these since all these people are listening and offering their help, there's a, a lack of communication, and I don't think it does any good to put any blame anywhere. But you know, let's start talking about it and clear the air. And that's that's a concern. I'd like to bring it up right now. I know a lot of people are listening, so uh, I've made that uh, uh, suggestion and I put it out there. I'm I'm certainly available anytime. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, do we have a county administrative office update? Oh, David, did I see your hand go up? No. Oh, he just made a comment. Um, um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, I know Sia is on the line, or she was. Let me see if I can find her. Oh, there she is. Oh, Commissioner uh, Willie has his hand raised as well. Yeah, uh, Bob, I had to jump off there off the video for a second, and I do need to run to another meeting, but uh, I heard you. I completely agree. Um, I, I heard and I noted uh, the, the 4-H representatives uh, that are in this meeting tonight, and I think um, I'm going to circle back with uh, Leah and certainly with Tanya Angie and, um, and Gary Seidel. And let's, we're gonna to put together a plan of action to have better communication and see what we can come up with that will, um, that will make everybody happy and certainly make next year's fair, uh, something that uh, everyone's proud of. So I've heard all of this tonight and certainly uh, we're going to move ahead and to the 4-H and to the FFA people and to the horse people, um, we've heard uh, your concerns, and we're going to take some action on that. So, um, Lee, uh, see if I if I jumped ahead of you there. I'm sorry on that, but uh, I certainly have heard all of this, and uh, we will take steps to make this a, a better fair and certainly make everyone um, feel a part of it. So, thanks for that. And now I do have to jump off and go to my next meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, see ya. Are you still there? I am still there. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Good. Thank you all. This is Cia Lindstrom. I'm with the County Administrative Office. 
Um, and I have uh, very little uh, tonight to share. I appreciate uh, listening in on the meeting and um, I was grateful for uh, Commissioner Willie's leadership just now on that um, as uh, the liaison between the Board of Commissioners and, and the Fair Board. And I know he'll uh, take that role well. Um, my only update is uh, that for the Memorandum of Understanding, uh, Leah has the joy of going through a little more public uh, review process than most people do. So this is just a reminder to the Fair Board uh, that per the Memorandum of Understanding, I seek your um, feedback uh, on Leah's performance and I am requesting that that uh, come to me confidentially by the end of the week, if you can. I have heard from a good number of you already, which I really appreciate. And I'm um, happy to, uh, to chat about that if uh, that's the easiest method. Um, are there any questions for me uh, in terms of the county administrative update? Great. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, that brings us to the last item, which is oral communications once again. And this is a opportunity for those who have not had an op not had a chance to speak to uh, address the fair board for a period of up to 10 minutes five five minutes yes it's five minutes is there anybody who wants to address the fair board at this time uh, we've got janet tilp go ahead janet hello my name is janet tilp and i'm a 4-h superintendent for fiber goats i do want to address the um, communication issue. I think the, the, there's been a failing of communication for many years. Um, I kind of would like to suggest that, you know, because of COVID, it has revealed a plight of food security in this country with a lot of shortages of food, such as meat, dairy, and produce. And a lot of people don't really know where their food comes from. And I think this is where the county fairs come in. County fair is where we can highlight agriculture to the public, and have them show the importance of having more locally sourced foods. I also think it's really important that the fair board and the fair management show their support to the ag businesses 4-H and FFA program. The fair community, the county fair is an excellent format to showcase the agriculture and locally produced foods and to teach the public about where their food comes from. Having the public know about their local agriculture businesses is a must for a very important topic to the fair board, I would think, to promote the future of agriculture in our local communities. So the youth in 4-H have a passion about their project and they want to use the fair county fairs to educate the public about their project. By supporting the 4-H program and FFA, we can have the youth educate the public about their projects and their animals. This provides a win-win solution, I believe, for both the youth and the public and the fair County Fair, where the youth can experience, uh, get the experience of sharing their knowledge of agriculture and of the safety of their animals to the public, and the public gets to learn about agriculture. However, a fair requires the time, energy, expertise, knowledge, and passion of 4-H leaders and superintendents. These dedicated volunteers spend countless hours helping the youth prepare and participate in the fair and, and all the behind scenes logistics to make the fair run smoothly and safely. I believe it's vital that we have the fair management who works with the 4-H volunteers by listening to their ideas, respecting their combined expertise of over hundreds of thousands of years of, of hours of experience and knowledge of the animals and the 4-H program and to implement some of our ideas for a better run fair. A good manager in business always knows they cannot know everything and they need to surround themselves with others who can bring different ideas and expertise mm -hmm. to the table. This hasn't always been the case between the fair management and the 4-H volunteers. And I believe we can have a better fair all around if 4-H can have a strong seat at the table and work with the fair manager and the fair management in a positive and collaborative manner. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Okay. Uh, now we've got Jan Har. Okay, Jan. You're still muted, Jan. All right. There. Now can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Can hear you. 
Uh oh, did we lose her? Oh, there she is. Okay, it keeps coming off. Okay, can I try it again? Yep. I can hear you. Okay, a volunteer and a horse superintendent. So I'm addressing what is item number three on the document you guys received, which is the horse arenas. And as stated, the arenas were deemed to be unsafe and the footing not appropriate for the events that the Horse 4-H offers. As the members and families were moving in on Friday for our fair, it was determined that the warm-up arena was also not going to be safe for the youth or the horses. Thankfully, we had the use of the 60-foot round pen that was intended for lunging use only. We proceeded to scrap all of our schedules and patterns to make the round pen work for our fair. We also used the grassy areas around the pen for some of our classes. Our judge graciously rewrote all the patterns to consider the safety for the youth and the horses on the grass and in the round pen. We had to make these prudent decisions at the last minute, but the youth were amazing at adapting to the unusual, not normal arena. During our fair, myself and our superintendent, my other superintendent, would have welcomed the fair board members to visit while we were making do with what we had. We would have loved the opportunity to explain why we made the decisions we did and to explain why the arenas were not deemed suitable for the youth and the horses. These arenas have the potential to be very good arenas that can be used by 4-H and others in the community. We would like to see a committee or a task force formed to collaborate with the fair board on making these changes and recommendations. We, we would also like the opportunity to bring in advisors and or professionals to give guidance and recommendations on how to accomplish the work needed to have safe arenas for 4-H youth, members of the community and the horses. This committee task force should be made up of 4-H horse volunteers, professionals in the arena and horse industry, community members, and the fair board, which Leah has addressed already. Time is of the essence in getting these arenas suitable for use in the future. There could be potentially, there could potentially be equipment that needs to be brought in, footing removed, footing amendments added to or replaced, and funds needed to accomplish this. With the fall rainy season coming upon us, this will make it very difficult to get it all done. The warm-up arena also needs to be addressed and that too will be discussed by the committee of the task force. In order to plan for our 2022 4-H horse fair, we need a committee task force in place working on how to accomplish these necessary changes with professionals, advisors, horse volunteers, community members, and a guarantee that the arena will be usable and completed for fair by November 15th of this year. This November 15th date is the final date that Yamhill County Fairgrounds has given us to get some dates secured and a deposit paid to secure those dates. We very much want to be a part of Washington County Fair and have our fair at the Washington County Fairgrounds. But until we see any forward motion on implementing changes being included in discussions and working together to make safe arenas for the youth and the horses, we need to have a plan in place so that our youth can have a safe and successful fair by 2022. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jan. Okay. Uh, hold, yeah. let's see, we've got uh, Jen Reynolds. Go ahead, Jen, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. I think I was successful, correct? Yep, we can hear you. Perfect. So my name is Jen Reynolds. I have two boys who show sheep, goats, beef cows, not only at the county fair, but the state fair as well. I'm the Washington County 4-H Sheep Superintendent, as well as the co-chair for the Youth Livestock Auction. First, I would like to say thank you for taking the time to listen to those who have chosen to speak. These people are here to attest to a wonderful program for children that really feels like it's being pushed to the wayside. Why do people go to the fair? Why? To be entertained. Whether that be from the carnival rides or the animals, people want to do, taste, and see all they can at a fair. From the livestock side of things, this fair is failing your customers. 
we just spent five plus days at the state fair and it's a whole different world. The public loves the interaction they get with the kids and their animals. If you attended the first weekend of the Washington County Fair, you got to witness a Longhorn walked outside of the biosecurity zone set for these kids. Let's be honest, if this was really about public safety, whether this guy had insurance to cover that exhibition or not, the biosecurity aspect was gone. No one followed him to clean up the mess that his animal did leave, yet people loved it. Longhorn pictures for days, hello social media. Yet here sits the 4-H kids, one of the best attractions at the fair, whether you believe it or not. In livestock jail, away from the public, where the people can only peer in and barely interact with the kids and their animals. Yes, biosecurity is needed. Yes, biosecurity is important. But just not to the degree that people are only able to walk by instead of interact with the public or with the kids and the animals. Offer the public these opportunities especially with the kids who were dying to talk to them and not only provide a show for the public, but to educate them. Offer your patrons the experience of interacting with a sheep, a cow, a goat, whatever. It's not like they don't touch the pens, which are equally as dirty, if not more than the animals. I'm not sure if you've seen how often the kids bathe those things, but it's often. I'm asking, can we please revisit the biosecurity measures Maybe create a team that is there to protect the public while letting them have their interaction with the kids and their animals. Something they post on social media that drives all their friends and families down to the fair. Like Leah mentioned how awesome the little calves were. I know many people would be happy to make this happen, to work with the state fair vet, Washington County Health, whomever it's needed, just to make a visit to the barns a more memorable experience for the patrons of the fair. Thank you, Jen. Um, any questions? Is there any, if there's no questions, is there anybody else to speak? Are, aren't some of those bio, the, our, our uh, plans and what we've done, was, doesn't a lot of that come from the county uh, and what we had to do for risk management? Do a we, lot of it did come from, pub, from public health, yes. Do, do we have it? Do we have the ability to disregard them? Uh, I would say we do not have the ability to disregard public health. Um, I, yeah, I think our county council and our public health would have a lot to say about, and our insurance um, and our risk department about ignoring um, biosecurity or disregarding the policy that public health helped us write. Well, I, you know, I think to, to, to lay that issue at our so feet when yeah, we're not so, the decision makers is not fair. Yeah, the Oregon State Fair is not um, a public agency. They're a private um, nonprofit. And while I sit on that board, I regularly um, am surprised and discouraged by their lack of biosecurity, but um, it's... It's not a priority to them, and they aren't governed by a public agency that um, insists that they do it. Uh, I, can, I know that we 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 would love to give we'd, we'd love to be able to do everything that you know that was just discussed there. It, it's not like we're saying no and and throwing up a wall and telling you just you know we we don't we don't care what you think. Um, uh, there, there are many times where decisions are made uh, where we're just delivering the information of what are what our, uh, on, on, on things that we have no control over. Uh, and I don't, I don't think the other side here that's uh, bringing this up understands that, you know. Um, there are people with the county to go with, you know, um, that, that, that issue the orders to us. You know, it's never easy to be in the position where you have to deliver news that everybody's not happy with that you have no control over. So I'd like them to think of that and find a workaround to that 
that would be positive. And that's what I have to say about that. Yeah, Bob, I'm I'm not sure we don't have any control. We probably do, it, although it be it would be tough now that we're joined at the hip with the with the county because the county has the deep pockets, and if there's a lawsuit, that's where the lawsuit ends up going. Um, but I guess what, what frustrates me the most is that when biosecurity raised its head as a real issue nationwide, in fact, worldwide, because we see increased um, um, incidents of people getting sick or dying because of certain, uh, certain uh, contaminants. When that happened, we had, our, we had a, um, what was it, a seminar, uh, a presentation to talk about it. And we invited the folks from the public and nobody showed up or very few showed up. And that was, a, that was the chance for everybody to sit down and really work through what kind of biosecurity measures do we do and, and what sort of tolerance for risk do we have? And unfortunately, um, uh, people didn't show up and didn't get engaged. And so they don't see what's happening worldwide. They don't see the trends that are happening and that we have actually had incidences right here in Washington County and a bad one in Clackamas County. And um, we don't wanna take on that risk anymore. So anyway, that's, it's frustrating to me because this should be a collaborative effort, but when we ask for collaboration, we don't get it. Yeah, it's, it's a fine balance. I mean, would it be easier for us to do no biosecurity? Of course, it would, it would save a lot of grief, a lot of headache, a lot of money, a lot of time and effort for our, from our staff, um, but it's the right thing to do. It's what public health has asked us to do is to, and risk has asked us to do to keep the public safe from, um, from E. coli and other animal related diseases. And, um, it, and it's hard, I get it. And, and our 4-H and FFA partners and open class have really been resistant and have not really you know, wanted to take part in it. And it's been a battle constantly. So um, if if they want to try to re-engage and, and work with us to make it easier and better and maybe try to work with public health, um, I would certainly welcome that. But unfortunately, I mean, even this year, we, you know, we saw a lot of challenges. Um, you know, yes, one of the, the Longhorns, the kid that had the Longhorn didn't understand. He got schooled as soon as I started, you know, I had 4-H people blowing up my email, um, you know, using it as an example. And of course, as soon as we got that, we went over there and corrected the behavior from the Longhorn group. Um, but we have a lot of, you know, a lot of problems. You know, this year it was, you know, 4-H people taking apart gates to, you know, circumvent the biosecurity checks and um, circ circumvent the foot washing. And it's very disheartening. And um, it's risky behavior that causes that puts the whole fair at risk um, and puts the future of the fair at risk. Yep. Okay, any other comments? Well, no one else can hand is raised. I think that uh, we are done then. Can we talk about, do we have a meeting next month? Uh, yep. We have, our next scheduled meeting is November 3rd. Um, I, I actually am thinking that we might want to schedule a meeting for next month, but, um, it may let me get well we have a joint meeting um in fact i need to remind you all of that we have a joint meeting with the board of commissioners on i've got to look on my calendar and yeah, go ahead and send that out as quick as you can my calendar is getting booked up pretty quickly yeah it's october 12th at 11 a.m okay so that is our next um official meeting, but um, that is our joint meeting um, with the Board of Commissioners. So, but I do really want to get moving on several topics, especially the arena. So um, in the absence of another meeting, um, I will certainly keep you all updated via email. And if we need to schedule another meeting, I would be happy to do that. And if there is someone on the fair board who would like to join me um, in working with a small committee on the arena, I would certainly welcome the, um, the assistance on that. Bill Ganger would like to do that. Uh, you cut out there for a minute. Where is that meeting going to be with the uh, joint meeting? It's going to be um, at this point Zoom. Oh, okay. Uh, Leah, I would also like to be involved in that okay. arena issue. Great. So I'll put together, I'll work with um, Alice at 4 H and get a couple people from the 4 H 
workforce department and um and i you know i while you, while you guys were talking i was looking up this efficient arena that joe casper mentioned in the um comments and i'll reach out to them this week and see if we can get um get a group of people together really really soon because i i agree with jen this time is of the essence yeah yeah one of these days it's going to start raining and then it won't quit till spring we hope i'm, I'm hoping for <laughs> Okay, well, if there's nothing else for the good of the order, then uh, then I will uh, adjourn the meeting. All right, thank you all. And thanks, Andy, for taking over the meeting today. Sure, yep, thanks to everybody for being here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye all.